By the start of the 1990s, the Troubles had been going on for more than 20 years. More than 3,000 people had been killed, thousands had been imprisoned. The scars were countless. The IRA was as far away from its goal as when it started, but still asserted its right to wage war. There's been strong condemnation of the IRA bomb attacks in Northern Ireland in which six soldiers were killed. And in the past half hour, another body has been found at the scene of one of the bomb attacks in Londonderry. That October, the IRA added to the toll by bombing two army checkpoints on the Irish border. Six soldiers were killed, five of them here on the Derry-Donegal frontier. The youngest was 19. Four masked men took Patsy Gillespie from his home in a nearby housing estate while his family were held captive. It's understood he was forced to drive the bomb right into the checkpoint. Father of three, Patsy Gillespie was a civilian cook at an army base in Derry. In the IRA's eyes, a collaborator. They took Patsy away at midnight. They let him into the living room to say goodbye to us. And I was sitting in the armchair with Jennifer and Minnie. And uh, he put his arms around us and says, don't worry, girl, everything will be all right. I'll be home soon. Forcing civilians to deliver bombs wasn't new. Normally, they escaped injury. Patsy Gillespie himself had been forced to drive a bomb before. But this time was different. This bomb was designed to kill him alongside any soldiers. The van contained, to my knowledge, 1,200 pounds of explosives. And Patsy was chained to the van. So he must have known then, I'm chained. I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to get out of here. Her husband did shout a warning to the soldiers at the Cosquin checkpoint, but it was too late. I said to the detectives when we went to the mortuary at Alton and Galvin, are we going to identify the body now? And he said, uh, coffin's closed, Kathleen. And that's, that's when I thought, uh, Something not right here. Patsy was identified by a piece of flesh which was found attached to um, a part of a grey zip of the cardigan he was wearing when they took him away. The IRA had made Patsy Gillespie into a human bomb. It remains one of the most shocking attacks of the Troubles. Some in the IRA shared the public revulsion at the tactic. It's a war crime, I mean, that's what it is. Let's call it what it is. I don't believe the volunteers are responsible or are, are war criminals, but the people that authorize it are. Um, fortunately, it stopped after, I think, two or three attempts. Um, uh, but uh, it was an appalling, appalling thing to do. And it's a war crime in anybody's book. But many, if not most, in the IRA saw the human bomb as a successful operation. In their terms, Patsy Gillespie's job, feeding soldiers, made him a legitimate target. A senior member of the IRA justified the new tactic speaking to a documentary team. An actor spoke his words. When you speak of the attacks at Kosh Quinn, the attacks at Newry, were collaborators who were actively assisting the maintenance 
and supply of British terrorism in Ireland. Martin McGuinness, with a public face, as a senior politician in Sinn Féin, the IRA's political wing, spoke to a Dutch reporter at the time. The people who have been targeted by the IRA are, are themselves making a conscious political decision to take the British side in the conflict. So, so you see this as a justifiable punishment for well, well, as, a human, as human bonds? Well, well, the IRA see it as a just... I mean, it's not my job. It's not my responsibility to justify what the IRA does. I understand the reasons why it happens. Martin McGuinness had every reason to understand why it happened. At that very moment, he led the IRA's Northern Command, which organized the human bomb attacks. And yet, that very same month, McGuinness, the unapologetic advocate of the IRA's war, was talking with an officer from British intelligence, talking about how the conflict could be ended. A three-hour meeting took place at this house in Derry, just a few miles from where Patsy Gillespie and the five soldiers were killed. Few knew the meeting was happening, and with good reason. This was the first direct contact between the British and the IRA since 1976, an indication that both sides knew there could not be a military resolution to the conflict. The troubles had come to a stalemate. Britain could and did rebuild bombed border checkpoints. And the IRA could always find new ways to attack them again. They could inflict damage on the security forces. The security forces could inflict damage on them. That could go on almost indefinitely. When I mean a stalemate, it's perhaps the wrong word. But um, a draw with a lot of uh, costly goals on both sides, if you like. Uh, that meant that it was not going to produce anything other than a groundhog day of violence again and again. Out of sight, change was underway. Secret talks instigated by priests at Belfast's Clonard Monastery had been taking place between the leader of constitutional nationalism, John Hume of the SDLP, and the leader of republicanism, Gerry Adams. We developed, I think, enough trust in each other's just personalities to continue that dialogue through some awful incidences. Hume challenged Republican dogma. The greatest obstacle to progress was not the British presence in Ireland, but IRA violence. The greatest injustice in the north of Ireland today is acts committed by paramilitary organisations like the IRA. The taking of human life is the greatest injustice. Other injustices can be corrected. People can come out of prisons but people cannot come out of their graves. But he was also listening to Adams, who had told him he was interested in finding a political alternative to the IRA's campaign. An opening that Hume brought to the attention of the British and Irish governments. In um, Shakespearean terms, you know, I was one of the people who was there to set the scene. Peter Brook, the new Northern Ireland Secretary of State, had already concluded that Republicans might be ready to compromise. I had the sense that something was changing. There was, in fact, a debate going on uh, within uh, Sinn Féin um, uh, as to whether the policy which they were pursuing, which was violent and, 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 and significantly violent, um, uh, whether, whether it was in fact going to be successful on their side. 
Brooke wasn't alone in his conclusions. He had come to Northern Ireland with a new set of officials and a new approach. Not to defeat the IRA, but to take Republicans into politics. There was a, a group of us, and we all had a similar outlook. And in Peter Brook, we had a, a Secretary of State who was very sympathetic. I think all of us knew that um, conflicts never end with a straight victory of one side over another. That there is always, when there is a, a conflict, including violence going on on a big scale, there has to be a political process as part of the resolution. Now, just days after the secret talks and the IRA's human bomb, Peter Brook's new team decided to take the initiative. They arranged to send the IRA a message. In the view of Republicans, Britain ruled Northern Ireland as colonial masters. Brooks set out to directly challenge that claim in a speech. If in fact people were dying because people misunderstood the position of the British government, uh, then it was extremely important that we actually got over what the, the situation was. This new declaration was to be made publicly, but not shouted from the rooftops. Peter Brook and his advisors had crafted what they hoped would be a defining speech. They decided it would be better delivered here in London rather than Northern Ireland. The chosen occasion, the annual luncheon of the British Association of Canned Food Importers and Distributors. Walter. Hi. Thank you very much for agreeing to meet. My pleasure. Walter, what was that about? Did you have any idea? Well, it was lunchtime. <laughs> but it was amazing, amazing, because nobody expected the policy speech. At present, a great number of these people clearly do not feel or wish themselves to be Irish. In the, the famous Peter Brook speech to the to tin can operators, or whatever they were, was a way of declaring publicly to the Republican movement um, that the British government was open to progress. Now I'm going to show you something. This is the actual event itself. And we thought he was going to talk about food importing. <laughs> the obstacle in the development of a new and more exclusive, inclusive Irish identity, if people want this for themselves, is not to be sought in Great Britain. Those who live here would not bar the way if at some future time that were to be the wish of the people of Northern Ireland themselves. Partition is an acknowledgement of reality, not an assertion of national self-interest. The border cannot simply be wished away. They look a little bit bored. They look a bit puzzled. Well, they were puzzled rather than <laughs> bored. <laughs> yes, they were, because they, you know, they didn't know he was going to do that, but I, I had no chance of saying anything to anybody other than the chairman to say, listen, he's not going to speak to us about importing food. He's going to make a policy speech on Northern Ireland. Brooks' message was so low key that when it came to the really important thing he had planned to say, the camera had been switched off. Britain, he said, had no selfish, strategic or economic interest in Northern Ireland and would accept unification if the people wished it. Three separate points which it made were devoted to at least sowing the seed that it might be that we, we there was a logical other logical reasons for our taking the positions that we were. That, you, that Britain wasn't a colonial power. Yes, that's right. The real audience for the speech was the IRA leadership, which was supplied with an advance copy 
by intermediaries. Sinn Féin President Gerry Adams stood as the unrivalled Republican leader of his generation. Our message is one of continued resistance and popular struggle. We are committed... To For decades, he'd kept the movement united. We are not merely going to respond... Our message to the 1990s is a reasonable one. Britain out of Ireland, national self-determination for the Irish people. Searsha, Tart, August Sheercoin. For America. His comrade in arms, Martin McGuinness, knew Adams was talking about negotiating an end to the war. Both were on the seven-man army council that ran the IRA. Key ally Pat Doherty was later named in Parliament as another army council member. All major decisions were voted on, and because Adams also had the support of 1940s veteran Joe Cahill, he was virtually guaranteed to overcome any opposition from the three remaining members. And because the Army Council had the final say on IRA matters, it meant Adams and McGuinness were the dominant force in the IRA. What was your understanding in 1990 then of where Jerry Adams was? That um, that part of the leadership of the provisional movement, um, with their mantra of the bomb and the ballot box, or the armor light and the ballot box, um, in a sense shared the same analysis that we did, that the security situation was not a win-lose, it was a nobody wins and that the only forward path was through some political dimension. The British were better informed than most of the IRA's rank and file. They remained focused on the armed struggle, believing bombs still carried the loudest message. Prime Minister John Major was only two months in office when the IRA came close to killing him. The nature of the weaponry used today points directly at the IRA. A van with mortar tubes hidden inside until the moment of firing is a standard IRA system. Right back across the end of the street. Right the mortars had been made by the IRA's engineering team, working with the IRA in South Armagh. Are they the same type of devices that was fired at Downing Street? The exact same device. And the ones that were fired in Downing Street had Semtex high explosives in them. 45 pounds of Semtex, which is uh, one of the highest explosives you can get. South Amar was probably the most secure area at the time uh, from a security point of view. Former US Marine John Crawley was an IRA veteran. He knew the value of South Armagh to the war. It was the jewel in the crown of the IRA, no question about it. You know, operation, I mean, one in six soldiers killed in the Troubles was killed within three miles of that square in Cross Glen. South Armagh had become essential to sustaining the IRA's war at every level. Patrick Mercer worked in army intelligence. We all sat around talking, and then suddenly the Major General, the Commander of Land Forces, said, I can't believe it. I'm sitting here with a bunch of highly paid and, and clearly bright, able people talking as if I was a second lieutenant and dealing with a sniper. Um, what have we come to? And everybody sort of, sort of had a nervous laugh. 
And he said, but this is the point, isn't it? That two or three expert gunmen can hold the British Army, the RUC, and the British government to ransom by every so often killing or wounding a small number of men, but in a particular style. But South Armagh was the exception. Elsewhere, the IRA, despite a massive hidden arsenal that Libya had supplied, was coming under increasing pressure. Loyalist paramilitaries were killing more people than the IRA and using intelligence from the security forces to target Republicans and their families. There's been no official comment, but the incident bears all the hallmarks of a covert operation. And at this stage, it seems highly likely that the SAS were involved. Informants and technical surveillance compromised IRA operations, leading to deadly ambushes by British special forces. The attrition rate was just so appalling, you know, the um, SAS. You know, the British intelligence services were obviously, you know, in a position to, uh, to intercept most operations. Kieran Conway was a top-ranking IRA man across three decades. He had joined up in 1970. It was absolutely clear that we were losing if we hadn't already lost the war and, uh, you know, that it was uh, time to cash in the chips. The intelligence world played an immense part in bringing about, shall we say, a realisation within the provisional IRA that they, they had passed the post in terms of the armed conflict. They give it, uh, as they would see it, uh, their best shot. Uh, it didn't work. This is the annual Republican commemoration of Wolf Tone, an 18th century Irish revolutionary honoured for his role in shaping resistance to English rule. Little more than a ritual of remembrance today, during the IRA campaign it was an opportunity for the leadership to signal policy and road test strategy. In 1992, it was used to send a message to the British, among others, to indicate that the IRA was ready to move on. An ally of Gerry Adams gave a speech suggesting that the IRA had become trapped inside their own struggle. They should, he said, ask themselves if they had been deafened by the deadly sound of their own gunfire. Anthony McIntyre read the speech in a jail cell where he was an IRA prisoner. I recall that speech very well. The message that Jerry Adams was sent out to the Bodenstown speech in 1992 was that the IRA is open for business, uh, that we are telling you that we cannot hear what has been said above the sound of gunfire. That's a clear hint that if we get real talks going, the sound of gunfire will no longer be heard. Adams, in effective control of the Army Council, was shaping the evolving political strategy and the secret talks. Who wants to be involved in a war? Who, who when, when it was obvious that, that issues could be resolved if, if there was political will to resolve them. With the approval of um, others, most predominantly McGuinness, he decided to explore uh, the possibility of a peaceful outcome. I think that's what happened. It was concealed from the membership. My OC at the time would have been on the Army Council. He would tell me things occasionally, but he certainly never, never, never spoke of that. So I had no inkling uh, it was going on.
When the secret talks with John Hume were eventually revealed, Adams was deliberately coy. All I want to say at this time is to confirm that John Hume and I have met. And this is not the time for detailed comment. Publicly, Gerry Adams never spoke on behalf of the IRA, insisting he wasn't even a member of the organisation. The IRA has its own position and it's made that clear. But all Republicans are committed to, to building uh, peaceful justice in this country. Adams, the most influential voice on the IRA's Army Council, was doing a complicated dance. His doublespeak meant even IRA members were often unsure if their leader was speaking for public consumption or if he was telling it as it was, an ambiguity which always seemed to suit his purposes. Outwardly, Jerry Adams stood with the IRA's continuing campaign, as when he carried the coffin of a bomber who died in an explosion which killed nine Protestant civilians. None of the deaths were going to deliver the United Ireland the IRA had fought for. Adams had to revolutionise Republican strategy. Negotiations would be needed to be conducted through talks, not bombs. To prepare, Gerry Adams headed to Dublin for three days of discreet advice on talking to the British. His tutor once headed the Irish government's Anglo-Irish division. This is the first time Michael Lillis has spoken publicly about it. He wanted to get a feel for how it was to negotiate with the British and to what extent could you rely on, you know, their commitments. Clearly, in his mind, there was the prospect of engaging in some sort of operation of that sort. Negotiating with, Negotiating with the British, with the British yeah. By the end of 1993, the Hume-Adams process had led to a declaration by the London and Dublin governments offering talks with Sinn Féin if the IRA declared a ceasefire. It makes no compromise on strongly held principles, but it does embody a common view that there is an opportunity to end violence for good in Northern Ireland. This is a historic opportunity for peace. We hope that everybody will grasp it. The British also said that they wouldn't stand in the way of the IRA's ultimate goal, a united Ireland. But there was a catch. A united Ireland could only happen with the consent of a majority in Northern Ireland. That gave unionists, at least in the immediate future, a veto over Irish unity. Kieran Conway was working in Sinn Féin offices that day. He was bitterly disappointed. Charles Major, basically you underpinned principle of uh, loyalist consent um, uh, and reiterated what had always been British policy from the outset. And um, I was in the Owen Fulbrook office watching the television there and the mood in the room, might have been 15, 20 people in the room, was one of the deepest despondency. And then a call came from Belfast uh, from Jerry Adams. He had said, don't worry, everything's moving in the right direction. And the mood in the room lifted. Everybody started smiling and uh, they were all delighted themselves. I just looked around and I thought, fuck this, I'm out of here. And I walked out. Kieran Conway left the IRA that day, believing that it had become subordinate to Sinn Féin and the demands of politics. Unimaginable 
only a few years before. But the vast majority of Republicans were prepared to keep their trust in Adams. People like Colum Lina, whose brother was killed by the SAS at Loch Gaul. I think there was huge ambition for peace in Ireland and it was time. There was very little detail in these discussions, assurances and um, promises that um, something major was afoot. The belief in and trust in the Republican leadership was such that uh, few doubted that it would be the end in anything else other than the delivery of um, major gains in that process towards um, a sovereign socialist republic. And so, on the 31st of August, 1994, the IRA ceasefire was announced to the world. The IRA announced that from midnight tonight, there will be a complete cessation of its military operations, news which was greeted with jubilation on the streets of West Belfast and has drawn a welcome from politicians around the world. Republicans celebrated. After almost three decades of continuous violence, the ceasefire was branded a victory. This is a generation of men and women who have fought the British for the last 25 years and who are on defeated by the British. They have created, if you like, a crucial moment, a decisive moment in the history of this island and of Anglo-Irish relationships. This struggle is not over. This struggle is into a new phase. The ceasefire meant Sinn Féin was now headed for the promised talks with the government. But not everyone was convinced it was a time for celebrations. No, I didn't join in celebrations that day. Turkey celebrating Christmas? No. IRA veteran Anthony McIntyre was and is a critic of Gerry Adams. The British offered the conditions on which they would leave this country, and those conditions were with the consent of a majority of people in the North. That was the condition that the British offered the IRA, and the IRA, after fighting that for 25 years, suddenly decided to say, this is a victory. But most in the IRA, like Dublin man Matt Tracy, were content to wait and see, taking their line from the leadership, who privately made it clear the ceasefire was conditional on political progress. It was kind of the understanding that, yeah, it was going to be subject to review and if given the impression that there was this timetable there and that if that wasn't adhered to, then it would be all bets were off. Loyalist paramilitaries first characterised the IRA ceasefire as a surrender. But six weeks later, they followed suit. The permanence of our ceasefire will be completely dependent upon the continued cessation of all nationalist Republican violence. The sole responsibility for a return to war lies with them. For Republicans, there were signs of progress. Sinn Féin met officials, but formal negotiations were put on the long finger. 
the Conservative government, which increasingly relied on unionist support, needed more convincing the IRA's war was over before substantive talks could begin. Ministers before it happened had been saying, I think expressly, that if there were a ceasefire, people would be amazed at the imaginative response they would give. When it actually occurred, ministers turned out to be rather more cautious. There was a slight temptation to look a gift horse in the mouth. Soldiers adopted a softer profile, leaving their helmets in barracks. Checkpoints, including the border post where Patsy Gillespie and five soldiers were killed, were dismantled. But no proper talks were on offer. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, Republicans wondered exactly what they were getting from their ceasefire. We were hoping there was something in it that we couldn't see, or there was some, you know, you know, the leadership had this aura, you know, this, you know, there were this galaxy of talent who, who are, you know, can't be second guessed and are running rings around the Brits. Colum Liner recalls how at one meeting in a country hotel in County Cavan, the organizers insisted on turning the sound system off for maximum privacy. It was an old veteran Republican from the 1920s there. People asked questions, what was the nature of um, the negotiations? Where were they headed to? What was happening? And very few answers, no answers in fact. It just assurance something big was going to happen and um, the old man retorted by we didn't really need to turn off the sound system did we then seven months after the cavalcade and the celebrations in west belfast the government declared that sinn fein couldn't get into talks until the ira started to decommission its weapons Sinn Féin were furious. In their view, the government had changed the rules. For the IRA, decommissioning was tantamount to surrender. If in 1995, the IRA leadership had said, we're going to decommission these weapons, what would the rank and file response have been? I think that about 95 would have been a, a rebellion. The walls of West Belfast spelt out the IRA's position. Not a bullet, not an ounce of Semtex explosive would be given up. Of the moves made by the government side in the process, the early focus on decommissioning was the one which with hindsight, or possibly even with foresight, was, was most obviously a mistake. In November, the Republican leadership took centre stage here at Belfast's Ulster Hall, the first gathering of Republicans inside the Unionist Citadel. It was intended to be a sign of progress but it exposed how little there was to show for the ceasefire. In my opinion, many people out there in the community, and I presume that the IRA are amongst them, are asking the question whether or not we have a peace process. And I think that many within the nationalist community are coming to the conclusion very rapidly that we don't. What Martin McGuinness didn't say, but he clearly knew, was that the leadership was facing growing opposition to its strategy from inside the movement. From those suspicious that the leadership was prepared to compromise Republican principles for political gain.
it was time to turn the IRA's war machine back on. The alarm went out just an hour after the alleged end to the ceasefire. A bomb had rocked the Canary Wharf area of London. Buildings shook, two partly collapsed, shattered windows sent out showers of glass. It was John Greaves' first day as head of Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist unit. Absolute devastation. It was like the apocalypse. There was wreckage everywhere. There was a 19-minute warning, but two people died and more than 100 people were hurt. The peace process also appeared fatally injured. It's an indication from the IRA that they continue to be prepared to threaten the peace process. The IRA's war was back on, but this new campaign wasn't about bombing its way to a united Ireland. It was about bombing its way to a talks table. How do we pick up the pieces? By starting talks now. By finding a way to prevent this whole situation slipping into the abyss. This didn't make any difference to the threat the IRA posed but officials at the heart of the peace process understood its significance. The return to violence was tactical. What were you being asked to do? What were you being told by your political masters? I don't think it was what our political masters were telling us. It was what we were telling them. And what were you telling them? Keep calm and carry on. <laughs> to use a cliché. <laughs> You, because you, despite I mean, Canary Wharf, a huge bombs, yeah. two people died. Yes. Dozens injured. Yes. Though the bomb wasn't intended to kill people. As you know, the, it was an insufficient warning. I felt that the Republican leadership had gone so far into the peace process that if it simply ended with Canary Wharf, they would go down in Republican mythology as the grand old Dukes of York who had led their troops up the hill and then let them down again. And they were far too conscious of their reputations and so on, I think, to accept that. Last night, the police cordoned off a wide area around here after a news agency received two calls from someone claiming to represent the IRA and using a recognised code word. IRA bombers were now focused entirely on England. John Crawley, the former US Marine, joined the attack. The ceasefire was called off, and uh, for all we knew, it mightn't be on again. England was the belly of the beast. England's where we could do damage to them, you know, in the sense that uh, strategically you could, you could cost them. Leave this area, go down to Oxford Road, turn left. Leave this area. Keep going. There was a cost. The IRA devastated the centre of Manchester with a huge bomb in June. But the IRA campaign began to fall apart under familiar security pressures. Slowly coming across towards the jetty. A massive surveillance effort by the police and the intelligence agencies led to one breakthrough after another. IRA member Dermot O'Neill was killed by the Metropolitan Police. This is the actual recording of the police raid that led to his death. Dermot O'Neill was alive when he was dragged outside afterwards, his head hitting the steps. 
shot six times, he died shortly afterwards. Other IRA teams were arrested. Six members of the IRA have each been jailed for 35 years for plotting to blow up London's electricity supply. Police have described them as six of the most dangerous criminals ever gathered together in one place. We're going to knock out the power supply of the southeast of England. And uh, there, there may have been other operations after that, until, but we were, we were caught before we could uh, uh, do that. They were well disciplined, they reconnoitred their targets, um, they made themselves very busy, um, they did a lot of anti-surveillance work, but they weren't as good as the team against them. I described them at the time as the A-team. They were absolutely excellent. Um, one of them, John Crawley, um, ex-US Marine Corps, a uh, demolition specialist, you know, with this, this was the top sort of people for them to bring up. He just epitomised the cunning skills, experience of the sort of people they were putting against us. This was a top team. I wondered why they, they didn't kill us, because we'd have had men tooled up and everything. They knew where we were going. And to this day, I don't know why they just didn't take us out of it, because coffins coming back on the ferry would have been a nice message to anybody else looking to go. And believe me, there wasn't a lot of people putting their hands up to go in England. The IRA's New England campaign ended with two of its men dead. And some of its most experienced men in prison. Significantly, it didn't bring Republicans into negotiations. Sinn Féin's political support continued to grow. But while the IRA remained at war, Sinn Féin remained outside of talks. There were no warnings for either device. The second apparently left near the base's medical center in what looks like an attempt to catch those injured in the first blast and those helping them. The IRA now turns its attention back to Northern Ireland, bombing the headquarters of the British Army at Thiepfel. One soldier was killed, more than 30 people were injured. In IRA terms, the attack was a tremendous success, and it lifted some of the pressure on Gerry Adams, demonstrating the leadership's continuing commitment to the IRA campaign. But it didn't convince all of Adams's critics. They were about to attempt a coup. This senior IRA figure, Brian Keenan, would be key in what happened next. In the 1970s, he had masterminded an IRA bombing campaign in England. Now he was spelling out an uncompromising message. Don't be confused about things like decommissioning. The only thing that the Republican movement will accept is the decommissioning of the British state in this country. Three weeks after bombing the British Army headquarters, the IRA held an army convention, the first in 10 years. IRA conventions where delegates from every corner of the movement could vote, determined policy and key appointments. Crucially, a brand new army council could be voted in. Critics of the peace strategy, led by the IRA's quartermaster, Michael McKevitt, hoped to neutralize Jerry Adams and rebalance the Army Council with people they saw as hardliners.
Brian Keenan and convicted IRA gunrunner Martin Ferris from Kerry seemed to fit the bill. I think the plan at the time was to turn Adams to the Army Council, but have him surrounded by so many people who were not sympathetic to its strategy that the things would go the way that they wanted. But the plans went awry. The militarists elected Brian Keenan and Kerry Republican Martin Ferris onto the Army Council, believing that they would stand against the Adams strategy. They were wrong. Once on board, both men proved loyal to the existing leadership. And Jerry Adams, who had appeared vulnerable, emerged from the convention stronger than ever. The IRA's war did continue, but by comparison with the early 90s, with fewer fatalities. A breakthrough appeared to come with the United Kingdom general election in 1997. Martin McGuinness and Gerry Adams were elected to parliament. The celebratory mood was only heightened by the arrival of a new Labour government under Tony Blair. Soon followed by the arrival of a new government in Dublin under Bertie Ahern. Almost immediately, British officials signalled that decommissioning could happen alongside a talks process if Republicans committed to peace. It was an open invitation to proper talks for Sinn Féin if the IRA's war ended, but it didn't. The IRA ambushed two uniformed IUC men in the centre of Lurgan in County Armagh today. They shot them dead at point-blank range, threatening to plunge the province into a new round of sectarian violence. The IRA killings of beat policeman John Graham, father of three, and David Johnston, who had two children, were shocking. Even to a population used to the myriad horrors of the Troubles. They didn't kill representatives of the British state. They killed our daddies and they were sons and they were husbands and they were brothers. Here I get the spoons in case you take sugar. Louis Johnston and Abigail Graham were just seven when their fathers were killed. This is the first time they have spoken publicly about the killings. I just remember thinking that, OK, at that age, my dad's not there. I need to step into his shoes and try and help my family as best that, that I can. I think that's from that day I knew that's how I felt that I, what I had to do. I just looked at my mum that I love so much and just to see her so upset, it was very hard. For me, the most difficult part is just the way they played both sides of the game. Um, they had a political mandate when the when the Sinn Féin had a political mandate when our fathers were killed. They said that the British government needed to remove the obstructions for the talks. The obstructions for the talks was that the IRA was killing people on the streets. Just over a month later, the IRA declared a second ceasefire.
there's to be a new IRA ceasefire from midday tomorrow. And if it holds, Sinn Féin could be admitted to the Northern Ireland peace talks on September the 15th. I think it's a momentous decision by the IRA. I commend them for it. I think it places a very clear onus on people like me, on people like uh, Tony Blair himself. Once again, inside the IRA, very few knew in advance what was happening. Again, this caused some dissension, but the majority of IRA members were supportive. I didn't expect it. But my reaction was always hoping that there was something in it I couldn't see. The Brits want to leave and they need the space to leave and you'd hear all this stuff and look at all that gear came in from Libya and that's sitting there. But there wasn't much more to it. There was no more room for the ambiguity that had served the leadership for so long. In order to get into talks, Republicans not only had to concede the principle of consent, but they also had to agree that no longer could they claim the right to wage war. Now Republicans had to pledge peace and sign up to a binding code designed by American Senator George Mitchell to get around the decommissioning impasse. What came to be known as the Mitchell Principles required a commitment to nonviolence by anyone who entered the talks. So the issue was not whether they would give up their weapons, but whether they would give up the right to use any weapons they had in the political process. Essentially, no use of violence to advance political causes. When Sinn Féin signed up, it was a step too far for opponents of the leadership. They believed Jerry Adams was giving the IRA notice and accepting far less than they had fought for. The inevitable confrontation played out at another IRA convention at the remote Donegal village of Falcara that October. For the militarists, it offered one last shot at overturning the strategy of the Adams and McGuinness leadership. At stake, the very future of the IRA and the peace process. For the second time in 12 months, senior figures in the movement, including the quartermaster Michael McKevitt, lined up to oppose Adams and his peace strategy wanting to get back to war. An Irish police officer, Martin Ridge, wrote a report on the convention for his bosses. This is Ballyconnell House where the IRA meeting was held in October 97. There would be approximately 80 people, we were told here, you know, and uh, again, they stayed up all night, didn't sleep in their beds at all. Did the guards have any idea that was happening here? Not a clue, no. No idea whatsoever. It, just like any other weekend, you know, nobody knew what was happening under our noses, you could say. The one-night booking had been paid for in cash, £800 in the name of a community group. The Mitchell principles of non-violence dominated the debate. Opponents of the leadership argued the IRA couldn't agree to them. They tried to force the Army Council's hand by saying that no IRA member was allowed to sign up to the Mitchell Principles. Therefore, if you want to talk and sign up to the Mitchell Principles, you effectively leave the IRA.
I have spoken to several people who were there that night, including some centrally involved. They told me that the opposition was relying on Brian Gillen, named in Parliament as a senior member of the IRA, to back them. But at the last moment, Gillen signalled his loyalty to the Adams leadership. His support was rewarded with a place on the Army Council. They meticulously planned everything down to who was going to vote for who, people pretending to support the other side who had no intentions of, and they just wiped the floor with them. The final battle for control of the IRA had been won by Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness. They left Ballyconnell House to continue their work on the road toward a final peace settlement. Their opponents took another road, setting up a rival organisation, the real IRA, and going back to war. It was a defining moment for republicanism, the point where politics trumped the military strategy. But it set off a contest for the allegiance of the rank and file. Adams and McGuinness were going around the country to support the, the efforts into the talks which started in September 97. McKevitt was going around um, doing the exact opposite. He was building up the real IRA, but trying to convince those who had been in the, the real IRA or had been in the IRA to move to the real IRA. And it was his efforts that were worrying us because he, they, they were working very hard and they were having success. That battle was fought in small halls and back rooms across Ireland. They were a serious threat uh, to, to the Martin and Jerry project at that stage. And, um, you know, credit has to be given to, to, to Martin and Jerry for keeping that uh, on board. Most Republicans chose to stay with the project. One of the most influential figures was this man, Tom Slab Murphy. Murphy, from the military stronghold of South Armagh, was the IRA Chief of Staff and a long-time member of the Army Council. He ensured that the vast majority of the IRA membership in South Armagh stayed on board. Adams McGuinness, we talk a lot about South Armagh and the importance of carrying South Armagh with them, but they would never present them as difficult. In fact, they would say they were the greatest champions of peace in the whole movement. A protracted talks process at Stormont eventually concluded with the Good Friday Agreement. This is it. This is the you agreement. You have it in your hand. I have it in my hand. 67 pages. This agreement proves that democracy works. We can say to the men of violence, your way is not the right way. David Trimble, who led the Ulster Unionist Party, then the largest Unionist group, agreed to share power with nationalists, including Sinn Féin. I look forward to the future. I hope that the people of Northern Ireland will endorse this agreement. I hope that we will be able to move together, forward together, in a positive way. Sinn Féin has a vision of the future of an Ireland free from division and conflict, a society in which there is equality for all citizens and where all our people can live together in peace. And we believe that this can be achieved in our lifetimes. It was an historic compromise involving all the major political parties in Northern Ireland, 
but not Ian Paisley's Democratic Unionist Party. Ulster is not for sale. The historic agreement was then voted on in both parts of the island and endorsed. Yes, 71.12%. John Hume had come up with the idea of the simultaneous referenda to meet the Republican demand for the right of self-determination by the Irish people. Dissidents were dismissive, saying it was copper fastening partition. But it seemed Northern Ireland had finally moved beyond the decades of conflict. Here, Spanish tourists enjoyed the new atmosphere in Oma, County Tyrone. But the car behind them contained a 500 pound bomb. Miraculously, the two people in this photograph survived what happened next. The photographer did not. Twenty-nine people died, including the mother of unborn twins. It was the worst single act of violence in the entire Troubles carried out by those IRA members who split after the showdown in Fulcara. It was such a ghastly, murderous event. And Adams and McGuinness, after some persuasion, uh, condemned it, because again, Republicans didn't traditionally condemn acts by other Republicans, but they did. Martin McGuinness had once made car bombs. He and Jerry Adams had previously defended similar attacks. But this time they condemned their former comrades, undermining the real IRA and underlining the significance of the different road they had chosen. It was quite a big decision for them, and I imagine it cost them something internally to do so. But if they hadn't, we could have lost the Good Friday Agreement at that stage after the Omar bomb. After such horror, support for the breakaway dissident Republicans was minuscule. The planned release of paramilitary prisoners began on schedule just three weeks later. The near universal condemnation of the Oma bombing emboldened former enemies to sit together and eventually share power in a restored Northern Ireland government. The course of the Northern Ireland conflict had changed irrevocably. In 2004, Republicans gathered in Belfast for the funeral of Joe Cahill, a key Adams ally and a founding member of the Provisional IRA. The IRA was now behaving like a peacetime army, still recruiting and training new members, ready for the next outbreak of war. It was part of recruitment process. Even while the ceasefire is full on, why were they recruiting? I suppose partly it may have been a way of ensuring that people who wanted to join something didn't join the real IRA or the continuity IRA. But also that people hadn't kind of gotten around to the, accepted the idea that it was the IRA was going to cease to exist at some stage. By the time Joe Cahill's funeral brought West Belfast to a standstill, Jerry Adams's revolution of IRA strategy 
was complete. It had finally begun to decommission its weapons to the satisfaction of an international panel of overseers. We have now reported to the British and Irish governments that we have observed and verified events to put beyond use very large quantities of arms, which we believe include all the arms in the IRA's possession. Few recognised it at the time, but Cahal's funeral marked the end of an era. The IRA he had dedicated his life to had caused the deaths of at least 1,900 people, with many thousands more injured. Got on IRA rank and file had paid with their own lives or with long prison sentences. And after all that, a united Ireland still existed only as an aspiration. Comrades, we have lost a great Republican and a true friend. His vision of a new Ireland, a free Ireland, outlives him. But that vision would be fought for by Sinn Féin alone. Let all of us go recommitted and our resolve to continue our struggle and to carry on until that certain day. Go to Mina Margov. If a united Ireland was to happen, it would happen without the IRA. The following summer, members of its Dublin Brigade were called to a meeting. 50 or 60 people there, maybe. The person who was sent down was a prominent member of, or had been a prominent member of the IRA, he was on the Army Council, as far as I know. State the point, he said, that's it, lads. It's over, it's finished. Your eyes has been stood down. If you want to be involved in politics, join Sinn Féin, that's it. There was people that needed coin, and they were, what are we supposed to do? And he said, I just told you what you can do. Join Sinn Féin, get involved in your union, get involved in real politics. It's over, it's finished, there's no more IRA. A final decisive public statement followed. The leadership of Hogan O'Hearn has formally ordered an end to the armed campaign. All IRA units have been ordered to dump arms. All volunteers have been instructed to assist the development of purely political and democratic programmes through exclusively peaceful means. Sinn Féin, no longer a party with an army, made peace with their oldest living enemy in 2007. Ian Paisley had once vowed to smash Sinn Féin. This stance helped him and his party come to dominate unionist politics. But now, with the IRA gone and the chance to actually head a Stormont government, he accepted Republicans as partners. From the depths of my heart, I can say to you today that I believe Northern Ireland has come to a time of peace, a time when hate will no longer rule. Deputy First Minister Martin McGuinness had once vowed to smash Stormont, but now sat at its head. We must overcome the difficulties which we face in order to achieve our goals and seize the opportunities that now exist. This and future generations expect and deserve no less from us. The troubles were at an end, a triumph of compromise. But it was a compromise that gave few answers
and as we are about to reveal, left many secrets in its wake. Many are held by the paramilitaries. Others held by the state have been hidden even from those charged with searching for the truth. We've got something like a million documents, uh, tons and tons of paper. But there's a large cache of um, intelligence uh, and other documentation elsewhere in Derbyshire, which we had never, been, never seen. No one has ever told us about it. And that may well take this story further. Um, and if it does, it needs to be exposed. And as this secretly recorded conversation will reveal shortly, there are more state secrets still concealed from public scrutiny. We have found documents that Stevens never found. This series began in the political furnace of the 1960s, when demands for reform and the bitter resistance to those demands effectively burnt down the Northern Ireland regime. There are no great mysteries about why the trouble started. What has been less clear is why the fighting came to an end. Any notion that the IRA was defeated, you know, that the IRA was on its knees, the IRA could not have uh, protracted uh, the war is entirely and absolutely nonsense. The question is not really who won or lost, but what made the trouble stop? And the answer is that there was a collision of a number of seemingly unrelated factors that shaped an opportunity for peace. An opportunity that even at the time, few in Northern Ireland could comprehend. When the IRA delivered the 1994 ceasefire, it had the armory to sustain its war almost indefinitely. But the security forces were making it very difficult for it to function. And when attacks went ahead, IRA units risked being ambushed by the SAS. The IRA did as best as they could, I suppose, uh, in fighting the intelligence war, but they hadn't a chance. They, they, they were effectively scuppered from within and confronted efficiently from without. Loyalist gunmen were killing more people at the end than the IRA, and calculatedly targeting Republican communities. They were helped in this by elements of the state's security structures. Collusion, a fact determined by a future head of Scotland Yard. We knew collusion had taken place. We could prove it collusion had taken place. We had the evidence that collusion had taken place. And then, perhaps the most important factor of all, the war without end was transformed by talking. The biggest human problem facing our society was violence in our streets. If thousands of soldiers in our streets couldn't stop the violence. If I could save one, even one human life by dialogue, it was my duty to do so. The opportunity for peace that these factors shaped was a recognition of the futility of an endless long war. The decisive argument, rather than advancing change, Violence was an obstacle to change.
the legacy of the Troubles has not gone away. The way forward is haunted by public inquiries, inquests, and the spectre of people, soldiers and paramilitaries alike, standing trial decades after the events. After the thousands of deaths and the maiming of many thousands of others, the biggest legacy of the Troubles is the search for the truth about what actually happened. And without the truth, it seems there can be no reconciliation. Instead, the conflict has become a contest over versions of the past. In this series, we discovered that the security service MI5 intervened to remove material from an inquiry set up by the Prime Minister. But we have also learned that there are even more secrets that have been kept by MI5 and other agencies. Out of reach for hundreds of reinvestigations, reviews, public inquiries and court cases. This is a photograph of members of the secret army unit that ran agents in Northern Ireland, the Force Research Unit, or FRU. This man, Ian Hurst, secretly recorded a senior English police officer last year. They were meeting about the latest investigation into Freddy Scappaticci, who denies involvement in multiple murders while working as a British agent in the IRA. Their conversation confirms that many more secrets have yet to emerge. We have found documents that Stephen's never found, thanks which are very telling about the role that our man played in certain things. In a redacted form and the fuller version... The detective revealed his team has been working full-time inside the security service, MI5, continually unearthing new material. And then as time, what we've now, or what we've been doing for quite a while now, is that we have permanent team, basically, with the service with them, going through each individual file. And we've, what, well, if people have deliberately got rid of stuff? What I take from that, yeah. right, as, again, so, so the service have kept the master file. The service have kept a, a lot more than... But it's not complete. I wouldn't say it's complete. But, yeah. but a lot more a than, lot more. Yeah. than... Yeah, and we're finding material... That's fair. We're finding material that they've got, but wasn't in the Stevens material and wasn't in the possession of MI5. The detective indicated that MI5 had kept material that other agencies had destroyed. I think there are documents that the service have kept that probably they should have got rid of. And that's the tree we keep shaking. Yeah. And a little bit more will come out. A little bit more comes out all the time. And we're, I'd say, on average, every at the moment, every couple of weeks, we're finding a new document that we haven't seen before, or a document that was given to us originally, or was or given to the Stevens team, can I say it, in a redacted form, and the fuller version is with some of the different agencies. In October 2019, 16 years after investigations into Scapatici began, this latest inquiry recommended a variety of charges against him and others. But beyond this investigation, the great revelation is that a huge cache of secrets is still hidden from the public, the existence of which now cannot be denied. As the troubles have receded into the past, old enemies have been careful to avoid letting light linger on what happened at the end. 
Republicans settling for less than a united Ireland, Unionists agreeing to share power with those they previously described as the political wing of the IRA, the state failing to disclose all it knows about the murders of its own citizens. This series has been a secret history of the Troubles, but it could never be the secret history because so much remains buried, hidden from public view. For the last two years, members of our Spotlight production team have been filmed as they uncovered the secrets from the past that you've seen in this series. You can see Spotlight on the Troubles behind the scenes Thursday night at nine here on BBC One Northern Ireland. Details of organisations offering information and support are available at bbc.co.uk slash action line or you can call for free at any time to hear recorded information on 08000 933 193. This is the fallout of all conflict. The common denominator was lost. It's there all the time and you learn to deal with it. The innocence. He loved life. Nothing was a problem. We didn't start the fire, we put the fire out. They were sons and they were husbands and they were brothers. The Troubles at 50. Available now on BBC iPlayer. 7 Extraordinary Continents. Each one full of life. Seven Worlds, One Planet starts Sunday at 6.15 on BBC One and BBC iPlayer. The BBC News at 10, now on BBC One Northern Ireland, with Donna Trainer in Belfast, Clive Myrie in the studio and Hugh Edwards in Westminster. Tonight at 10, we're at Westminster, where MPs have, for the first time, approved a Brexit deal, but they also delivered a blow to the Prime Minister. The eyes to the right, 308. The nose to the left, 322. In the second of two crucial votes, they rejected the government's timetable for debating the bill, but Boris Johnson took comfort in the earlier vote. For the first time in this long saga, this House has actually accepted its uh, responsibilities uh, together, come together and embraced a deal. Yeah. In a packed House, Labour's Jeremy Corbyn underlined the opposition of so many MPs to the short time allocated for debate. Tonight, the House has refused to be bounced into debating a hugely significant piece of legislation in just two days. We'll have the latest from Westminster tonight as MPs are told that delivering Brexit by the 31st of October is now virtually impossible. Also tonight, a senior US diplomat tells Donald Trump's impeachment inquiry he'd been told the president did want to give aid to Ukraine in return for dirt on a Democratic Party rival. We report from northeastern Syria on the victims of the fighting between Turkish forces and the Kurds and a new drug that could slow down Alzheimer's disease. Early tests by a US company are promising. On BBC Newsline tonight, the DUP votes against the Prime Minister's Brexit deal and timetable. And the government outlines its proposed payments for victims of the Troubles. Good evening from Westminster, where for the very first time the House of Commons has voted in favour of a Brexit agreement. But crucially, it rejected the Prime Minister's timetable for passing the necessary legislation. 
The first of two votes tonight was on the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, that's the main Brexit legislation, which runs to 110 pages and turns the Prime Minister's Brexit deal into law. Well, the government won that by 329 votes to 299, a majority of 30. But it then lost the second vote on the parliamentary timetable by 14 votes because a majority of MPs did not think that two days was long enough to scrutinise such an important bill. The Prime Minister said that the bill would now be paused and the EU has signalled tonight that it will accept the UK's request for another Brexit delay. Our political editor Laura Koonsberg reports on tonight's Brexit votes. A rare moment of silence and then a result. The eyes to the right, 308. The nose to the left, 322. <laughs> MPs kicked out the Prime Minister's timetable for speeding his Brexit deal through Parliament. Plenty of MPs don't want to leave, but even with those who do, the majority in here tonight thought it was happening too fast. Tonight the House has refused to be bounced into debating a hugely significant piece of legislation in just two days, with barely any notice and an analysis of the economic impact of this bill. The Prime Minister is the author of his own misfortune. Yeah. Yeah. So I make this offer to him tonight. <laughs> work with us, work with us, all of us, to agree a reasonable timetable. And I suspect this House will vote to debate, scrutinise and I hope amend the detail of this bill. I must express my disappointment that the House has again uh, voted for delay, rather than a timetable that would have guaranteed that the UK would be in a position to leave the EU on October the 31st with a deal. And we now face further uncertainty, and the EU must now make up their minds uh, uh, over how to answer Parliament's request for a delay. The opposition parties all said no to the Prime Minister's pace. This is yet another humiliating defeat for the Prime Minister this evening who has sought to railroad through this House legislation that requires proper scrutiny. The House has made a very wise decision to allow further time for...